Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad that you could join us today. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Make sure that your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide a smooth webinar. During the webinar, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, you can use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our upcoming webinars are uh, next Thursday with Katherine Grant. She'll be giving a presentation on Family Search's uh, person page, specifically the Memories tab. Following that, we will have a presentation from Ada Nelson uh, the following Thursday, and she'll be talking about online resources for Hispanic research. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Twitter and Facebook accounts. For today's webinar, we're pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on an updated look at myheritage.com. James Tanner has over 32 years experience in genealogical research is, and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He has presented at expos um, and conferences around the US and Canada. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving here at the BYU Family History Library. James has seven children and 34 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. And if you could wait just a moment, I'll get James's uh, presentation all set up. Howdy, this is James Tanner. Glad to be here again at the BYU Family History Library for another one of the webinar series and remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and posted not only to the BYU Family History Library website, but also to the uh, BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and look for BYU Family History Library, you'll find uh, all of our oh, around 450 now uh, as of the date of this uh, webinar. Uh, videos uh, that are available for, for watching. Um, this particular uh, webinar is based on my recent visit to the My Heritage Live conference uh, for 2019 held in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And uh, I was invited over there to teach a couple of classes and to attend the conference and had a, a, a very, very interesting time uh, doing that. Um, all of the presentations for this conference are now uh, ready to be seen. They're now linked uh, from their blog and I'll switch over to that and we can uh, scroll down to the bottom of the page when you sign into MyHeritage, you can get to their blog uh, click out this little cookies notice and look at the blog. And uh, we have uh, all sorts of, of presentations, but here uh, is the link on this, on their MyHeritage blog to all of uh, the lectures that are now on uh, online and presented, including my two classes. So all of them are available. And there's a whole list here with links to each one of all of the presentations that took place uh, at the conference. These are all free uh, and uh, you can watch them anytime uh, that you like to do that. Um, the most important one from the standpoint of finding out what's going on with uh, my heritage is uh, Gilad Jaffet's uh, presentation as the keynote. And he had also spoken at Roots Tech earlier in the year. So uh, this was sort of an update of the things that had happened at uh, Roots Tech and uh, basically updated to uh, September when this conference was held in Amsterdam. Um, a couple of things, and I'll cover the things that are updates, but before we get into the update, it's kind of interesting to uh, to 
see what we're dealing with here, not uh, so much in the United States uh, as in Europe. Uh, My Heritage is is easily the most popular program uh, on genealogy from Europe, but it is uh, not quite as uh, popular here in the United States. So I'm gonna have to go back to the program itself. So let me go back one more click. And I'm going to look at the bottom of their startup page or their homepage and uh, about us. This is a aerial view of the office building. Uh, The headquarters of my heritage is in a town outside of Tel Aviv, Israel. And uh, these are the, the main employees. And just uh, scrolling down a bit on that uh, about page here, we give a couple of statistics that might be interesting about the program. Currently, there are more than 105 million users on this website. Uh, Give you some uh, perspective here. Uh, One of the most recent statements from FamilySearch about their uh, number of users on FamilySearch It's about 14 million plus. Uh, Ancestry is no longer publicizing the number, but the last numbers were in the 2 million, 3 million range. Uh, They may have many more because of their push with DNA. And I know they have more than a million DNA tests out there. Uh, But those numbers uh, kind of uh, don't give you a perspective unless only in the sense that the difference here is 105 million users worldwide. And by the way, in every single country of the world, that's uh, the main thing that uh, is interesting about this program. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about why that's important and and how that helps us to use. Obviously, uh, MyHeritage has uh, a lot of profiles, meaning number of people that they have on their website, in their family trees and uh, how many historical records. The historical records here says 9.6, but that has since changed. It's now a little over 10 billion uh, historical records, increasing at the average of about 800 million new records every month. So that is a, a kind of a, of a benchmark, as you can see, that this is a, a little bit different world to get into uh, when you when you realize the number of people that are involved in this particular program. So if we go back to the main website here, a uh, couple of things, important things that were announced in this particular uh, presentation was a new program. And this is called uh, education.myheritage.com. And this is where all of the uh, instructional videos uh, are going to be posted, including the ones from the conference. It's a new website, and it's uh, basically designed to educate people about MyHeritage. And they will be posting, as you can see already, how-to videos as well as uh, webinars as they, as they are presented, and uh, articles. There is a company that was purchased by uh, MyHeritage some time ago called Legacy. And uh, Legacy Family Hist- the Family History Program had a, program, uh, a desktop genealogy program called Legacy, which many of us were using in past years. And this... Uh, and they began a series of webinar broadcasts and they just celebrated their 1000th webinar, which I think is a little ahead of us since we only have about 450, but that's okay. No contest there. And um, uh, that is part of their company now and how it is, um, uh, and they are including those webinars as fact as they are uh, appropriately uh, attached to uh, my heritage education section, so this was the this is one of the, the the news items that we had there in the uh, at the conference. Um, 
Another big part of the conference uh, announcements had to do with a program called uh, DNA, uh, excuse me, their DNA health section out of my heritage. Uh, in this particular part of the uh, section, you can, for an extra fee, um, uh, you can take a DNA test, obviously uh, not included in your uh, membership of, of uh, my heritage. So you can take a DNA test and get uh, a report, and I'll talk a little more about that in a, in a little while. But uh, what they've added in now is some uh, health-oriented uh, DNA testing. Uh, both my wife and I uh, took this extra test. Uh, it actually didn't have to take any more to the test. We just had to buy uh, the, uh, uh, the extra work to be done on the original DNA, which we had already uh, obtained through uh, DNA test that we'd obtained through MyHeritage. So it's more of an add-on than a, than a separate item. And so uh, we received our DNA test the other day. And the only thing I can tell you is from my perspective and my understanding of my own personal background and, and the knowledge I have of my parents and grandparents, et cetera, is there were no surprises at all. Now that could be different with you. You might be uh, very, very surprised or, or even concerned at some of the things that uh, they can find in this DNA test. So there's a process to go through and, and you need to answer uh, quite a few questions before, uh, before they go through with and supply you with the DNA and information. Then particularly the important thing is that it is, all, is it's also um, uh, very much involved with uh, uh, directing you to a proper consultation with health professionals, with practitioners uh, who can, genetic practitioners who can explain informa more information or you can obtain more information if you need to about uh, the, the initial testing procedure. Um, kind of go back home here to uh, the startup screen. Um, Oh, there's a, one other area, and that has to do with uh, the uh, blogs, and I'll mention that. That has to also to do with DNA testing, and that is that uh, MyHeritage acquired a couple of companies recently, and uh, these are um, uh, the companies they acquired were uh, Prometheus and SNPedia. SNPedia is uh, there, these are database programs uh, online. Um, one of them, SNPedia, was free, and Prometheus was a, a paywall program that is now, they're now both owned by uh, MyHeritage. And they're databases that cite over 30,000 peer review scientific publications and uh, about DNA. And they have a uh, Encyclopedia, uh, resource for information about genetic markers that's evolved to cover over 110,000 genetic variants. And uh, Prometheus is a liter literature retrieval service. So the consumers, people who are, who are uh, using that service can uh, compare it to see relative scientific findings regarding their particular uh, genetic makeup. So uh, there was a uh, service charge, and I understand that that may be waived for uh, MyHeritage users uh, from now until the end of the, um, the year, perhaps. Um, that was not, that was left a little bit open-ended. So there may be a charge and there may not be a charge, but I think that it was waived for, um, for all of the users of the MyHeritage website. Okay, that was kind of the news, the news about the addition of a health uh, segment for the DNA, uh, the addition of an education website, and the uh, idea of uh, uh, having a huge database of genetic variants to, uh, to, to give a better uh, support for both the health end and the genealogical side of the DNA testing. Now, 
Um, a couple of things we need to learn about in the program that uh, one that was extremely important and one that uh, takes a little bit of more explanation. And so I'm going to get into some explanation about the program itself. Um, one thing about the program that is important to understand is that when you have your family tree on myheritage.com, uh, MyHeritage uses a superior uh, sort of search engine called SuperSearch that will look at every single one of the people in your family tree and match them to all of their 10 point, a uh, little more than 10 point billion uh, records. And the interest here is that all of the records on MyHeritage are indexed in depth. And so those matches are, uh, are very high, uh, have extremely high accuracy, almost, uh, and in my experience, it's, uh, uh, they're accurate uh, well above 90% and uh, probably around in the close, almost close to 98% accuracy. Now, Obviously, they're not giving you every last, uh, they give you every last variation or possible variation. And so uh, when you do a regular search on the program, if we were to go into, uh, for instance, here to research and search all the records and start putting in your names and, and places and keywords and things and to search the records, uh, you would probably find out that um, uh, there were a lot of responses that were not the right person. Well, that's not the whole, that's not the, the basic way that the program operates. The website is, base, is designed to, <clears throat> to supply you with the record matches to all of the historical records in their collection. That's done automatically. So I just go to my family tree here on this and get rid of that. Now what you see on here is uh, a portion of my personal family tree on my heritage. And you see a lot of little dots all over the screen the, with all of the people in there have green and blue and I mean, excuse me, brown, green and brown. And uh, uh, they're sort of red dots, but they're not coming out too red on my screen here. Um, and those dots have a lot of significance because uh, the green dots are record, are uh, smart matches. That's a different category of matching. And the brown dots are record matches. So all of the people, in fact, almost every person in this on my screen here has, uh, has record matches that need to be, uh, need to be processed. If we go back to the home screen here, we'll see that I have presently 7,631 record matches. And this is a relatively new uh, file that I've uploaded that is not uh, nearly as big as the last file that I had on my heritage where I had over 21,000 record matches. Uh, incredibly large number and processing those is very interesting. Uh, but it brings up some uh, some interesting things about uh, developments at at uh, my heritage. So here, look at the record matches that I have. Just a list of all of those matches, and you'll see them here by category, and uh, rather than by person. So in this case, we can go down, and you'll see there's some records here to chronicling American historical American newspapers. Well, this is uh, the Library of Congress's collection of newspapers, uh, about 18 million plus pages of newspapers from all across the United States. And what has happened in another new development from my heritage is that uh, a program has been developed called free text. It's not that anything's free, it's free text, meaning that it's not structured text. And the structured text here, as, as opposed to a, a search, if I search on a specific name or date or, or place, that's a structured search. If I simply allow the computer to search 
all of the records, then that would be considered to be a free set, free, free text search. So chronicling America historical newspapers have been digitized and they've gone through optical character recognition. And then the further step taken by MyHeritage has been to uh, the program that was developed uh, actually by the CEO, Gilad Jeppa. And it was uh, basically looks at every word and then identifies all of the names. And the names are identified uh, in very broad categories because uh, my heritage uses more than uh, more, lots of different languages, up to 48 different languages uh, for identifying all of the names and all of the variants and all of the possible um, variants, like this, like names like William and Bill and Billy and all of those things. So those names are all then categorized in the, and extracted from all of the, this huge database of newspapers and all the books and all the other newspaper records and millions of pages of newspapers and over 400,000 books on genealogy. And then the program goes further. It identifies any relationships that exist in any of those texts. So if they identify someone named oh, say Bill Jones, and it says, Bill is the son of George Jones married to Martha, then the program, in a sense, makes a, starts creating a family tree for Bill Jones and identifies his parents. So anybody identified to uh, that person will be included in the search as being an identified person with that person. So you can get all this happen. So here's what happens when you do a, a, a search. Uh, if I'm here in Chronicling America, I can review, and right now I have 558 matches, and I am seriously losing ground. I have been processing these for months, and no matter what, it seems like I spend time and processing these, uh, they go up, the number goes up. In fact, it's gone up over 100 in the last week. So. There's a lot of people <clears throat> and a lot of information here. So we can go here and scroll down until we find uh, an individual that we're interested in looking at. And uh, here's, here's a person. Uh, this person was uh, one of my great uncles. Um, so and they have searched and found him in what's called the St. John's Herald and Apache News back in 1916 and identified him in the context of this particular newspaper. Um, this newspaper is for a very small town in Eastern Arizona called St. John's, Arizona in Apache County. And uh, in fact, one of the interesting things about this is that my grandfather was the editor of this paper for a while. So this is uh, kind of a, uh, even almost has a better, more of a connection to my family. But uh, here it is, he's gone through every, uh, every copy of this that's available and has found all of the relatives that I have and looked them up in this particular newspaper. So now I can review that match. And when I review the match in the newspaper, then I have uh, access to the entire page where the match was found. Uh, it is marked. Uh, where it is, but in this view, it's kind of hard. You have to zoom in and look around a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of text on here. But the interesting thing, because from my standpoint, is that my um, family, uh, both my grand, I, my maternal and um, uh, all, my, all my grandparents came from, all four of my grandparents lived in St. John's. They weren't all born there, but they all lived there. And uh, many of my great grandparents did. Uh, so this is a town where I am. I really have a lot of relatives. And so if I even start looking down the list of the uh, uh, local drift or anything about uh, any of the newspapers, any of the articles here, we're going to read through here and find people who are part of my family. So the second entry here, Marinas Christensen's, one of my great great grandparents. 
And it says he was a visitor to, to Hunt on Sunday. And Hunt is a little town uh, outside of St. John's. You go down even a little bit further down, you can uh, look over in the next column. And uh, they have a cousin here, Mr. and Mrs. David P. Overson uh, and Lyman. And so we've got all sorts of information about this. Uh, and that was that there was uh, uh, a funeral service for uh, one of the cousins. So you have here information about a, a, uh, a death notice. And it just kind of swimming down Harold Morgan sold his interest in the observer printing plant and looking for another job. This is when my grandfather left the printing business and uh, moved out of town, out of St. John's. And that's my grandfather. So Harold Morgan. So just looking here at Mrs. Charles Jarvis has yet return uh, that she's one of my direct line great grandmothers. So we have uh, uh, all sorts of people in this particular, uh, just in reading down through this newspaper, who are my relatives. Now, the good thing about it is that the, this, by using this program, uh, my heritage has identified all of these pages that are, are um, pertinent to my search. So uh, what we have is a, a situation where, yes, I have all these people, like Lois Jarvis, who's uh, an aunt, and uh, everyone else who has mentioned it, not everybody, but a considerably number of people who are mentioned on just this one page who are related to me. Now, I could spend my time going through and the Library of Congress website, for example, and looking up every single one of the people in my tree. A uh, few thousands of names, it might take me maybe a couple of years, uh, maybe I would get tired of it long before I got through. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things because there's going to be multiple mentions of all of these people in all of the different newspapers. And this is just one family in one, or one part of my family in one area and one town. Uh, obviously I have relatives from other places besides this. So, uh, we're talking about uh, a great amount of information that's been gained. And why do I emphasize this? Well, the reason why I emphasize this particular issue is because my heritage is, has all of the newspapers and all of these millions of pages of, of newspapers that are uh, being searched. And they have those basically part of their basic program. So if you have the full whatever of the program, meaning you need to have the data, what's called the data bundle, data, data portion, plus the premium version of the program, and you buy the whole program, then you would get access to all of these newspapers as part of the initial search. Now, mention this, there are no newspaper searches on family search. Uh, they have a, a separate section from their, from their uh, collections of, of records for books, which you can search. And MyHeritage has uh, over 400,000 books also included in this same search. In addition to that, uh, the other programs also charge a separate fee for uh, the newspaper. So uh, there's there's a lot of value here. But in addition to this value, one of the things that's happened, um, and let me just show you, go before I go into that, another part of it, let me get out of this full screen shot. And if I say I confirm this match, then what my heritage will do after a few seconds is um, it will then, uh, if I save it to my tree, Then after a few seconds, MyHeritage will use another part of the program called the Record Detective. Now the Record Detective takes the information that was in that record and using that as confirmation of the, of the identity of the person and the place, does additional searches for all of the other people who may be related to that person who are in the record. So now if you, could look closely, and I realize we're not, the screen may not be as readable as, as could be, but um, 
there are additional, they have found in that short period of time, an additional 65 records about this family. So I've now processed one of the records. And as I go through and process each of these other records, I will get additional record detective searches. And by the time I spend a day or two on this one person adding records to this family, I could probably, I may, may is a good operative word here, run through all of the, progr all of the records that are being found. It's not likely that I would ever do that. And the numbers of records are uh, obviously now into the thousands. And so we're just, uh, it's going to spend a, a, a tremendous amount of time trying to find, uh, trying to keep up with the information being supplied by my heritage. So uh, here's, uh, these records are not all the same person. In other words, this is uh, Clyde Overson. And then I have a record here from Pratt Overson, who was another uncle and Clyde's brother. And uh, I have already processed this one because there's a little green check mark here that says that I've already got it attached. So I, I actually have some distance to go here. So um, uh, there's one record here that I have not attached. And then here's another one that I have. So uh, it's not all, you know, I've spent already spent some time on this particular uh, relative doing uh, finding the extra people in my family tree. So now we have, uh, so th the important thing to, to look at here is that when you go to your family tree, and went back to that family tree, and remind that all of these little brown markers here are record matches. So if I go to uh, any one of these and click on it, I have the same thing, only in this case, rather than show me, showing me all of the record matches, they're showing me the record matches for that particular person. And here is another newspaper reference uh, about my uh, great-grandmother, who was uh, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis Overson, and she was... Uh, also lived in St. John's. I mean, we're going to get back to St. John's for my, from my standpoint uh, about as, much, as many times as I start searching because that's, like I said, the first uh, few generations of my family all lived there. And so uh, it's kind of the focal point of at least the first few generations of my family. So this is... Um, so. The, the idea here is that uh, you have a, uh, a tremendous body of, of, of resources. Now, one of the questions that comes up just in the back to last two days or so has actually come up a couple of times uh, over the last weekend. I taught class in, uh, at the Riverton Family History Library in Riverton, uh, south part of Salt Lake Valley. And one of the initial questions that came up is the one that comes up every time that I talk about these uh, websites is that, oh, well, aren't they, don't they have the exact, don't they all have the same records? And my answer to that is no, far from that. Um, they all have created their own unique set of records, unfortunately, or fortunately for us, fortunately, because that way we can keep track of who our people are some of those records overlap and are the same. For instance, everyone has all of the major websites, MyHeritage, uh, Family Search, Ancestry, Find My Past, all have U.S. Census records, which is a common record source. And uh, so those are the overlaps. But when you start to get into records uh, beyond that, uh, then you are looking at records that go far beyond the the number of records that are in the uh, that are in common between the the record sources. Another thing that's important to understand, for example, between my heritage and family search, family search has uh, a lot of records. They have about one point two billion records in their histor historical record collections. And then they also have a number of records in the, it, that are solely in the familysearch.org catalog. 
And those records uh, about, are a little more. There are more records in the catalog that are not in the historical record collections. Now, what's the difference? Well, the ones in the historical record collection, for the most part, are indexed. Not all of them, but most of them are indexed. The ones that are in the catalog are unindexed. And my heritage, as I mentioned earlier, all of their records are indexed. And so their effective number of records is much greater than uh, the number of records in, um, in the, a program like, in the website like Family Search. If we go to search all the records, as I did just a moment ago, you come down to a, um, a interactive map here. And this brings up a couple of other things that have happened uh, most recently in, uh, in my heritage. I mentioned the newspapers. Uh, one of the things that uh, was announced at the conference was that um, they were expanding their historical newspaper collections and that uh, they were going to uh, include now newspapers from Europe. And so they announced uh, a big collection of newspapers from the Netherlands and the, the plan is in the near future was to go add a, additional language newspapers, non-English language newspapers. So everything else, um, since my heritage is highly focused in Europe, uh, you would expect newspapers from uh, all of the European countries eventually to be included. They would be completely searchable, completely indexed word for word and searchable, of course, in the language that they're written in. It doesn't help you to go search in English, except they will translate your names into the languages of all those different countries. So if you search for John, whatever, they'll translate it to Juan in Spanish or Johan in some of the Germanic countries or whatever, Johannes and all the other variations of it. So that's, uh, that's another thing that's coming and part of it that's already available. Uh, down here, you can see very quickly what kinds of records they have. And another part of the uh, emphasis is on Scandinavian records. So here's the list of Danish records that are available. And for some time now, MyHeritage has had an agreement with Denmark to digitize uh, from the images or image the uh, records that consist of the church records and the civil records, including the census records and civil registration records and the parish records and what they call the house censuses. So this is a, a very, very uh, thorough collection of Danish records. In fact, it has all of the Danish census records back to 1787. Um, every year, completely indexed and searchable. And the, the key there is not that they're just indexed and searchable, but that families, that uh, uh, my heritage will uh, go and do a person-by-person -person search and match these records up at a very high level of accuracy to all of your Danish ancestors. And, the event, and what was talked about at the conference is that that's being expanded to Sweden. So if we go down to the, back to the, uh, the map and all the way back, then we can click here and see the Swedish records. There we go. And you'll be able to see this as this uh, collection of records uh, begins to expand and they begin to add uh, new records to that. That's a very active area. And essentially, if, you, if you're familiar with Swedish research, they have an agreement with Arca Digital, which is the Swedish database uh, to uh, index and and uh, put online all of the entire collection of ARC Digital. So everything from the Swedish collection will go online eventually. These are, uh, this incredible, uh, I don't happen to have Swedish ancestors, uh, 
and that's always surprising because I keep coming up with Swedish DNA, but who knows where they came from. Anyway, but the problem is, is that um, uh, this is, well, I was going to say it's not a problem, but my, the, uh, the, the issue here is that my wife is Swedish, has Swedish ancestors and uses this extensively. So this is a big thing. Now they're also, and another announcement that was made is that they're now going to do the same thing in Norway. So Swedish, um, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway will all be completely uh, digitized and indexed on all of the major records that they have in those countries. So, and they'll continue to increase into other types of records as they become available. So this is, this is a great thing. And if you're, if you do have uh, ancestors in uh, any of these European countries, Eastern European, Central European, even uh, Western European countries, you certainly would want to know about these uh, about this particular uh, advantage. Okay, um, of course, there's others. Uh, that's not doesn't exhaust the, the the kinds of records that they have. As I mentioned, the newspaper records are, are particularly interesting to me right now as to how they're in, in, uh, increasing and uh, very well could be uh, helpful to me as they get newspapers in Europe, although I, my ancestors are primarily in the British Isles, but uh, I do talk to people all the time that have uh, ancestors from Eastern Europe and from Central Europe. Now, um, let me go into one more thing here. Go back home. The second part of this program, uh, the search engines that work on this program is a, a section Sorry. of of the website called Smart Matches. Now, Smart Matches, I've got somebody coming in. Uh, smart Matches are people. And uh, if we look at the Smart Matches that I have here, um, I need to look at all of them. So let me go back. Basically, uh, uh, let's not call them pending. Let's get them new. Uh, let's see what I've got confirmed. Well, we'll just handle what we have here. There we go. So now we've got the smart match. So I actually have almost 2,000 smart matches right now with um, 833 different people. Now, these are different than the record matches, and this is a very different part of the program. Um, Basically, what this does in a smart match is match you up to a person, uh, someone else who has uh, this someone that shares a part of your family tree. Okay, so we're not talking here about matching names back and forth. We're not saying we've gone out and looked and found a William Springthorpe in another family tree. What it does is it looks for the patterns. It looks for the grandparents, the, the children, the grandchildren. It looks for everything in the pattern and matches those patterns off to people who share the same pattern. So uh, there's, a, there's a much uh, higher possibility that there's a, uh, an actual relationship. Now, the only thing that might happen, obviously, is that someone might have copied my family tree and uh, really wasn't related to me, but just picked up a name and decided to add my portion of the family tree. So there's, uh, but there's another, another situation here, another uh, way of uh, taking that further step to be, get a greater degree of uh, assurance that you actually are dealing with someone who's your relative that's uh, part of this, this uh, thing. Now, the thousands of names that I have here, uh, almost 2,000 names, and uh, uh, the, in my other previously, this I mentioned briefly that this is a new version of my family tree on here, uh, which I started over again with an import from Family Surge. That um, 
rather than having all of the information that I've had in my family tree previously, I had previous to this over 100,000 smart matches. So that gives you an idea of how many numbers that could come up with if you're a person like me that happens to be related to everybody you can think of. Um, in that regard, you know, just to give you some idea, because we are going to talk about DNA testing, I am in just a moment here, uh, because it's uh, very directly related to the smart matches. Uh, that really is the case, because uh, last night I taught a small class. There were six people there in the class. I was related to uh, three of them. Uh, the, uh, I was recently at the genealogy uh, BYU, Brigham Young University Family History and Genealogy Conference. In, it was in July, at the end of July. Uh, and uh, they had uh, a, a little app on the phones to uh, see who was kind of who your relatives were that were at the conference. There were 363 people who showed up on my, on my phone as being online and whatever. And 290 of them were related to me. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of what I'm up against as far as relatives are concerned. But uh, we have a lot of tools here that are enabling me to get uh, a, a tremendous amount of information about my ancestors and my family uh, that I find to be uh, amazingly helpful. Now, back to smart matches. Okay, so smart matches are going to say, like in this first set, that I have two matches of people uh, for my wife's, uh, this is a Springthorpe, of my wife's great-great-grandmother. Well, let's get somebody who's my great-great-grandmother and find somebody. Okay, so here's my mother's cousin father-in-law. Here's uh, another one, let's see, direct ancestor, uh, eight generations back, and I'm have a match with somebody who is who also says that they are a uh, descendant or may has this person Mary Roll in their family tree. Well, I have a couple of options here. If I if I wish to do so, I could uh, review the the match and confirm it. And when I did that, then the other person would receive a notice that said they now have a confirmed match with me. And then using the program, I could initiate contact with that person. Now, the question is, why would I want to do that with 100,000 relatives potentially here? I probably could spend most of my time just talking to various people about my family tree instead of doing anything else in my life. But in this case, uh, we would, you need to think about the kinds of people that would benefit from this directly. Uh, the benefit would come to someone who had relatives in a place where doing research was relatively or very difficult. So if your family came from Poland or Eastern Europe, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, Romania, uh, one of the Russian, former Russian, Soviet Russian states, if any of your family came from, uh, you know, Czech Republic, any place back uh, in the eastern part of the of Europe, then you probably are having difficulty finding genealogical records past to get back past the immigrant. If you had your family tree in my heritage, then they would be matching you to people who uh, were your relatives or your potential relatives and uh, at least matched up with the names and, and uh, the pattern of names that's in your family tree and dates and places and things. And so th that would give you someone that you could contact who you had not ever contacted, you didn't know about, and who is living in the country, has, um, knows the language, knows where the records are, and is interested in genealogy interested enough to, to get this. Now, the program takes that one step further. And where it takes that is to um, the DNA. And when you go to your DNA matches, and I, I can kind of get into DNA here for a minute, we'll come back to how this relates to the smart matches, is the ethnicity estimate that you have. 
if you've hey, taken a DNA test and you've gotten a, it, an, an ethnicity test uh, estimate, if you did that some time ago, a year or two ago, or maybe longer, and you've uh, had your, your uh, DNA test up on the programs for that period of time, you've seen something very interesting, and that is that uh, your DNA test results for ethnicity have probably changed, uh, maybe more than once. Maybe it's changed and evolved uh, over time. And this, this is basically caused by the fact that all of these companies have uh, very dramatically increased the number of people that they have on their testing basis. But in addition to that, uh, they are are working on becoming more accurate. Now, my heritage has a goal, as expressed by Gilad in his uh, presentation at the at the uh, My Heritage Live con uh, conference, to make that accurate, to make ethnicity estimates more than just a, an amusement or an entertainment value, but basically to give them real genealogical value by drilling down and doing testing on smaller and smaller areas of population, such as counties or parishes, and uh, in some with the goal that being able to match you to a specific area, saying your ancestors came from this part of Denmark or this part of what is now Germany or this part of what is now Austria. And so that would be able to focus this and more more particularly, and that will continue on and, and be developed, but that is the, the idea and the goal that uh, MyHeritage is trying to achieve. Now, how does this help you? Uh, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of people get involved uh, quite, uh, into, quite at depth into DNA analysis, but basically MyHeritage has supplied us with some DNA tools. And one of those tools that is what essentially uh, two tools one, uh, that um, that are that show you uh, and help you are kind of a, a, a of a way of short a short uh, a, a very easier much easier way to get to what is done with DNA analysis and that is a chromosome browser that will let you compare up to six different people's chromosomes at a time and explore the chromosome uh, variants. The information that's available has uh, the shared DNA in, uh, in centimorgans and also uh, can be not just sorted, but be compared uh, uh, by the program. So if I want to compare my DNA to, to some of these others, I just simply click on there their um, the name and uh, then it will uh, do an automatic comparison out to these people and show on a graph which uh, shared segments uh, of DNA that we have for a further analysis. But it carries, or the tools carry this a little bit further and the DNA tools that are available, there's a, a new one called auto clusters that's being even made more accurate and in an auto cluster, what happens is that uh, the program does, uh, the auto cluster program does a uh, uh, analysis of each of the people who, have, who show up in your DNA test. And then when it uh, plots them on a graph. And so what happens is that their names of the people go uh, across and down on this. And so the people who match up, they're the same names, match up are on the diagonal line. And anyone else who matches to anyone else there then creates this cluster of, of relationships. And all the people in this red cluster that's at the top of this uh, kind of uh, uh, example file here are related to the same common ancestors. So they have this, they share a common ancestor. So basically that enables you to reconstruct a genealogy of uh, people based on the DNA relationships. Now, that carries it over. Once you have that information, that carries it over to being able to reconstruct the, D the relationships, not just from 
matches with the smart matches, but once you have a DNA match with the person, then you know you're related to that. And once you have a cluster, then you have the potential of determining who the common ancestor was of all of the people in that particular cluster. Be pretty much mechanicalized. But then what, what um, my heritage has done has created another tool that has been enhanced now as of the conference announcement. And it, if you look down through here, you'll see that people might have multiple paths for relationship. So in this case, this person uh, is my, uh, peers in, my, in a family tree, uh, is also has, uh, is a second cousin by virtue of a theory of relativity and because of all of the other information that's here in, uh, in my heritage. So uh, in addition, by the way, that the theory, of rel the theory of family relativity, which we'll go to right now and see how that works, that gives us a, uh, a match of how this person could, is related. So let's see, there we are. So through my great-grandfather, and this is how we say it, not only does it show how we're related in this particular instance, but it does it in five different ways. So it's showing five different paths for the relationship that we have and using different records and different methods, including the DNA, including all the information that is available on my heritage and all the sources in all the family trees, and uh, also using, in many cases, the information from Family Search, of which it's a partner, uh, to help construct these uh, perhaps theories of connection. And when you get to them and have done the research like I have, you can see very quickly that they are accurate and there's no problem in determining who these people are and how they're related. But in cases where you haven't done as much rev, uh, uh, research or you've done far less or beginning research, this will certainly give you a leg up on connecting not only relatives that you know, but relatives who have trees and information on uh, my heritage and that confirm that you actually are related, which is a big problem if you're looking sort of blankly out at family trees online. Okay, well that kind of gives an overview of, of my heritage. Um, the, uh, go back to the home screen here. The, 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 I think the main thing to, that, that I took away from the conference and uh, basically have taken away from all of the direct contacts that I've had with my heritage over the years is that these people are intensely interested in genealogy. They are intensely interested in creating programs and techn technologies that will advance our ability to, to gather information about our, our ancestors. There, it's uh, in not enough time, obviously, in an hour to even begin to go through all of the information that's here available. Uh, just one more thing, kind of a now here at the end as we're, as we're ending up on this particular webinar, is uh, it's important. Uh, this is not something that was particularly highlighted in the conference, but I think is important. And that is uh, their instant discoveries uh, and discoveries. This is the instant discoveries. And what this does is it says, we have gone out and matched the sources, matched the individuals, and matched any particular DNA using all of those, those uh, those different uh, tools, and have found uh, additional people to add to your family tree that are not there. So here we have uh, 12 more people uh, that are not, not presently in my family tree. This is not really difficult to find people that aren't in your family tree, by the way, because you're talking not only ancestors, ancestral people, but descendants and so adding children and descendants is uh, a function that this program does very well also. So 
that what they're doing here is adding family members to someone that, yes, I've had this person in my fa family tree. I recognize the name for a long time, but uh, I have not particularly focused on it. And now I have uh, 12 more people in, in this particular family that I could add. Now, would I go out and check to make sure? Obviously, before I add each person, I would look at that to see if they're, if they're supporting documents and things that would help to establish this. And, and what would be even more important is if there's some kind of DNA connection to, that would uh, give me a, a way to do that. But here it's the work's being done. Uh, a lot of this work uh, is being done uh, when I'm not involved and there's more here potential than I can probably get to. Maybe in my lifetime, who knows? They, they may be faster than I am. Uh, well, thank you for listening. Uh, had, uh, if you have any questions, uh, leave them there in the chat and we'll uh, answer those questions. Let's go back to the home screen. Okay. Um, it says, Okay, well, the box with the colored cubes is called a, um, is called the, I'll show you that right here, is one of the tools, and it is the auto clusters. And to understand auto clusters, you may need to uh, understand the idea of clustering. And it's a little bit complicated, but uh, the idea here is that they are matching groups of people who share a common ancestor. So the people who are named along the top and the side of the box uh, who correspond to spots inside the cluster uh, are all interrelated. And uh, that's a tool that says, okay, you know all these people are related. What are you going to do with it? Uh, the answer is uh, you would have to then sit there and uh, look at the trees at, from each of those people and see where those overlaps were and then um, be able to see that uh, if there was a common ancestor, then you would know that all of those living people out there were uh, part of your family uh, in some way. That's a very, it's a very powerful tool for those who are analyzing uh, their DNA relationships. And it may take some time, but I've done a presentation on clusters um, and that's online, and there will be more, I'm sure. And I know that I'm seeing more, more analysis coming up about DNA clustering. So I hope that uh, it, the, basically it's an invitation to do some work, <laughs> if you want to put it down to it. Any other questions? Um, it looks like we have a question from Jay Ritchie. Uh, he asks, Family Search has many Chinese records. Is uh, MH involved in gathering Chinese records? Um, not that I'm aware of, but you can go to, the way you do that is go to the collection catalog for each of the records, uh, each of the companies. If it's uh, Family Search, you go to their catalog. If it's um, Ancestry, you go to their it's called a card catalog. Here it's the collection catalog. And then you can see by, uh, by just by category, here you have um, uh, India, Philippines, uh, records, um, Israel, uh, Thailand. Doesn't look like there are particularly any um, Chinese records yet on my heritage. They're mostly uh, most of their user base and most of the interest they have is in Europe, as I've mentioned, uh, Western, Eastern, and Central Europe. So you have uh, that's their main focus at the present time. Family Search does have a considerably a considerable number of Chinese records. However, you have to know Chinese to get into those records. So it's uh, uh, it's kind of interesting there. If you do know Chinese, they're going to be helpful. Any other questions? Uh, we did have one more. Um, let's see. Uh, Loretta Hendricks is 
uh, question is, we have access to MyHeritage at uh, the Family History Center. Um, is it free through a Family History Center or library? I think she's uh, referring to MyHeritage specifically. Yes, MyHeritage My Heritage is um, uh, free at Family History Centers. It's on the, uh, you can search it, but the, you can search, use this as a search to search for things. Uh, to have your family tree on and take advantage of the matches and the DNA and all of the other tools, you need to have a, uh, an account, uh, a complete data account with, uh, with MyHeritage. Uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, who are on Family Search can go through Family Search to obtain free access to the entire program does not include getting a DNA test. You have to pay for your DNA test and obviously your health estimate, but um, there's, uh, that's about everything else is included in the, um, those who go through an LDS access to the program. Everyone else uh, can go to a library and find it or uh, a family history center if they wish to look at it. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Um, I just wanted to mention that we will have a DNA webinar on the 17th. That'll be with Sarah Stoddard. I will mention um, the questions that were asked today about uh, the MyHeritage tools and see what Sarah has to say about that in her presentation on the 17th. Um, I see that there was a question about um, uh, Chinese genealogy. Uh, thankfully, we will be having a presentation on that uh, specific topic on the 31st uh, with Matthew Tyler. So we hope that you can join us for that. Um, and as well as the 3rd and the 10th, uh, we'll be having webinars on those dates as well. Thank you so much for joining, uh, joining us. If you'd like to share this webinar, um, it will be posted on our YouTube page and our uh, social media channels, uh, so you can um, watch that recording again, um, as well as uh, it will be posted on our website. If you'd like to see any other recordings of our past webinars, those are on our website and our YouTube channel as well. Thank you so much, and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend.